much like Mike, when I started going through my archives and unpacking the memories, uh, 15 years expands to an awful lot more than 20 minutes. I've worn Lynn to wave frantically when I start running out of time, because otherwise I'll, I'm in danger of standing here for hours and waffling. 15 years is a long time in the real world. In internet terms, it's forever. Uh, back in 1996, when ISPA was founded, the number of internet users in the country numbered in the tens of thousands, and 99% of those were at universities, because academia had a two-year head start on the commercial internet. And that's where I was in 1993. I was doing postgrad work at uh, Wits University, and our morning ritual would be to grab a cup of coffee and then all gather around a Sun Spark station and look at all the new web pages that there had been since the day before, because there were so few at that point that we could really do that. And we'd say, ooh, a museum's got pictures of dinosaurs. Let's spend an hour looking at dinosaur pictures. And that would eat up the morning. And once we'd looked at all the new websites, we'd all go back to our individual desks and look at the real content, which was all on Usenet News. Uh, on Usenet News, Mike mentioned Chris Pinkham. I saw a post in December 1993 from Chris Pinkham announcing the first commercial link uh, into South Africa from the internet company of South Africa, Tixa. So I also have Chris Pinkham to thank for hooking me into this industry. And myself and uh, a group of uh, four other students uh, decided that we were interested in this nascent uh, industry. So let's see what we could do to start pushing it along and doing some facilitation work. The first thing we did, oh, we were, we were um, enthusiastically called uh, ADAT, the African Internet Development Action Team. Sounds a bit like the Power Rangers, but we were students, so you can, you can blame us for that. Unfortunately, I only, could only find a black and white um, printed logo because this predated the Wayback Machine, so alas, the color version of the ADAT logo is forever lost um, to the ravages of time. We started, the first thing we did is started compiling information about ISPs, commercial ISPs in South Africa. I have here a list of ISPs dated the 1st of September 1995. Uh, that's a year, almost two years after the commercial internet had taken off. There are 26 ISPs and a pitiful three internet cafes listed, and this was a very thorough list at the time. This was comprehensive. Of the 26 ISPs listed, only three of them exist today still. One of those is no longer, Sanganet is no longer in the business of providing internet access. The other two, Internet Solutions and East Coast Access, I'm very proud to say, became members of ISPA in 1996 and remain members of ISPA to this day. So we were um, cheeky students and we wanted to do something useful. We could, there was a lot of distrust, as Mike mentioned, in the early days of the internet. And we felt that there were issues peering domain names and telecoms legislation. This was the year before the 1996 Telecoms Act was published. There was a white paper, green paper process. That act didn't have the word internet anywhere in it. Government didn't think this was a problem, even though it was drawn to their attention that it probably should. And we felt it was useful to get ISPs together to talk through some of these issues. But how do five enthusiastic but really uh, nobody students persuade a bunch of ISPs to get together? The answer is trickery. We sent to each of the uh, CEOs and MDs of the ISPs a letter saying, these other ISPs are going to be at uh, this meeting on this and this date. We'd love it if you could join us. Because there was paranoia in the industry, none of them wanted to be left out, and they all turned up, making our claim that everybody would be there true in retroactively. <laughs> we, we held four of these meetings through 1995. Um, including the one at which the COZA uh, domain was handed to Uniform in 1995. And this was really the, the, the forerunner to um, ISPA's existence, the ISP starting to talk for the first time about these issues. Uh, in 1996, um, ADAT, we ran out of money. We were poor students. These things were costing us money out of our own pockets. And as a non-profit with no membership base and no real funding, it became difficult for us to survive. And we variously got poached by ISPs. I went to work for um, the local division of Sprint in the US uh, for 16 months, which is a story in of itself. It taught me an awful lot about how not to run a company, uh, lessons which I'm very grateful. My, my one and only real job in my life was with uh, Sprint South Africa. So then, um, because of this background in, in um, facilitating ISP meetings, um, I got a phone call from Dave Frankel, who was the joint MD of Internet Solutions at early um, uh, 19, uh, June 1996 to say, look, um, myself, uh, Philip SLR, 
um, John Oliver from GIA and some other folks from, from ISPs are getting together tomorrow. Uh, you've had some experience facilitating this sort of thing. Please come along. And that's what happened. Uh, 6th of June, 1996, ISPA was formed. And ISPA has endured through three major overhauls of competition, uh, of communications legislation, three regulators, Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, Satra and Akaza, five and a bit, Minister, I didn't know until I researched this, that um, uh, Manto Shabala Simang was actually an acting Minister of Communications for a short period after uh, Ivy passed away. Um, and we've seen in our history an increase of the number of telcos in South Africa from one to about 500 in, in the time that ISPA's been around. So ISPA has endured for a lot. As internet organizations go, ISPA is actually quite old. This is a scan of the original constitution uh, of ISPA. I know it's the original one because it's missing the damn apostrophe after the S. <laughs> In 1997, I successfully lobbied to have it put in. The lawyers that drew it up did a great job drawing up the constitution, but their English skills were lacking, and we had as an agenda uh, item for that meeting to put the apostrophe in, and it's been there ever since. Uh, I've also managed to find some old proposed logos, none of which we went with because they're quite ugly. Uh, we did go with a, a logo proposed by the same company that today still forms the basis of ISPA's logo. So, in my mind, there are probably three phases of ISPA, the early days, middle days, middle time, and the more recent, the last phase. The early phase, 1996 to 2000, was mostly fighting telecom. We actually have telecom to thank for ISPA's existence. The only reason that the ISPs got together in June 1996 is because telecom launched Sykes. Telecom's uh, strategy for costing their internet model wasn't to calculate how much it cost them to provide the service. It was to say, well, everybody else is providing it at this cost, so we'll provide it at this cost, so we can try and monopolize that market. That was clearly their, their strategy, and for, for most of ISPA's early years, that was what ISPA did. It fought telecom. The establishment of the exchange points was almost an afterthought by ISPA, simply to demonstrate publicly that it wasn't just fighting telecom. So in December 1996, Jinx was launched. Uh, it's a very successful uh, side um, project for ISPA. Uh, the exchanges of, well, Jinx has run non-stop since 1996. Uh, but we really do have telecom to thank for our existence. Um, this was the period of the dot-com bubble. And in much of this time, I was the sort of point man for, for communications to ISPA. And I dealt with some very common bad ideas. My favorite one was people would phone me up and say, can I meet with you? I've got a great idea. This idea is to create an index of all the email addresses in South Africa, and we want every ISP to charge their customers five rand extra a month to be listed in this database. And then we'll sell this as the phone book for internet users in South Africa. So I would carefully explain that nobody, no ISP is going to charge their customers extra to be put on a spam database, and this was an atrociously bad idea. And the first couple of people I spoke to didn't believe me, and they went and tried this as a project. 18 months later, when I was getting these phone calls, I, I could save some time, and I could say, tell you what, I'll give you the phone number of someone I spoke to about this 18 months ago, and you can phone him up and listen to his sob story about how this cost him an awful lot of money, and his attempt at running this business collapsed. So, some very common bad ideas came up there. Um, in this middle period, there was a, 2000, 2005, there was a, an, an expanding, expanding focus on regulatory activities. Um, and actually, I'm going to jump back to the early phase still. One of ISPA's uh, earliest activities was to lodge a complaint with the then competition tribunal against telecom when it entered the market. Uh, telecom's defense initially to claims that it was undercutting these prices artificially is, no, we're not doing anything wrong. These are, we have done the calculations on how we cost our internet service. We're just not going to share them with anybody. Then at a certain point after almost a year of um, discussion facilitated by the, tri the competition tribunal, telecom strategy suddenly changed, and, and brilliantly so in retrospect. Their, 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 their stance changed from we're, we're not doing anything wrong to it doesn't matter whether we're doing anything wrong or not because we have, our monopoly extends to internet access. We have exclusive right to provide internet access in South Africa, and everybody else that is doing show should actually be shut down. 
This was problematic. It put Esper on a back foot, going from attacking telecom for being anti-competitive to defending its right to exist as an industry. Sutra was established in 1997. Sutra was the forerunner to ICASA. And the very first project they ever took on was uh, to deal with this issue of whether telecom's monopoly extended to internet access. And uh, this is their pronouncement. Pronouncement P0001 that came out in October 1997. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, sitting with Mike Lowry, uh, Dave Frankel, and some uh, other names. Uh, Tracy Cohen was on this uh, advisory committee that uh, gave input to ICASA on this. And on the 14th of October, they issued a pronouncement on the basis of the advisory committee's advice that uh, IP services are to be provided under a VANS license under Section 40 of the Act. This turns out to be very important when we get to 2009. The clarity from the regulator at the time that internet access was part of a VANS license is in part why today we have 500 operators with those licenses. Just keep an eye on the time. So early days, fighting telecom, establishing the INCSES, the middle period and expanding focus on our regulatory activity. Um, ISPA became the go-to organization for any bit of government that, that had any, anything to do with the internet. Um, we saw the, the ECT Act dealing with online uh, sales, dealing with uh, cryptography, authentication, some very uh, animated discussions in Parliament about various sections of that Act, uh, many of which have held out to be um, I uh, uh, told you so for industry now, looking back at the, the feedback that was given to, to Parliament and the Department of Communications at the time. Also in 2000, we launched our teachers training program. Um, now I, I want to give credit here to Hillel Schrock. Uh, I had coffee one morning with Hillel and he said to me, well, ISPA's doing some good stuff for the industry, but we're not doing anything to give back to the community. So I, I really think we should start a project to, to do something with the industry. Um, and I think it's becoming clear that the internet has a really important role to play in education. Let's find some enthusiastic teachers to train. But um, the most important thing from that meeting that Hillel said was, I don't want this to be something that ISPA does to get attention in the press. So if we do this, I'm going to insist that we have a two-year moratorium on making any comment publicly about this project. He said, I want ISPA to do this because it's good not because we want the press to get press attention for doing it. And that's what happened. For two years, we didn't mention a word for this. We got the project up and running. Once it was up and running and established, then ISPA did go out and publicize it. But even today, when we do press coverage around the teachers, we focus on the local publications where the teachers live to give attention to the teachers that go through the program rather than, ISPA, rather than on ISPA's efforts um, to support it. Then moving on to what I think is the last phase in ISPA, the latest one from 2005 to 2011. ISPA has become a more mature organization. Uh, we got formal recognition from the Minister of Communications uh, a few years ago as an industry representative body, which gives our members some certain um, uh, legal protections, limitations on liability for content on the networks, very important. And we've seen in this last period um, a lot more activities, anti-spam activities. We publish a, a hall of shame shaming South Africa's spammers. This has gotten us uh, at least one complaint to the Competition Commission that was thrown out, thankfully, and regular threats of litigation from the people we list on the Hall of Shame. Uh, this is an area where every time we have a, an ISPA meeting and we say to the members, will you support us if we have to go to court to fight these spammers, there is a unanimous reply of yes from the ISPs in the room. And this last phase has been characterized by an increase in our partnerships, not only local partnerships with the South African Police Services, Film and Publication Board, various bits of government, but also increasingly importantly our, uh, uh, our partnerships with our international um, counterparts. We've heard presentations from uh, a number of my colleagues from around the world, and over the years these is, this has been very important for us. It's important to know what's happening in copyright le legislation in Australia. Uh, we can get a heads up so that we can head things off at the pass. Uh, and those partnerships really have been valuable to ESPA. So a couple of highlights for me, uh, ESPA, over the years. Although it was uh, an afterthought uh, to, to prove that ESPA wasn't just about fighting telecom, um, the Joburg and Cape Town exchanges have been a delicately balanced success story. I like to say that our INCS policy is successful because it makes everybody equally unhappy. Uh, and that's quite important for an industry association. If everyone's equally unhappy, you're doing a good job. 
as it happens. Um, this is stats from last night. The Joburg Exchange is now pumping three gigs of traffic. That's over the public switched infrastructure. Important to note that most of the traffic at Jinx does not go through the ISPA switch. An awful lot of it goes through private connections. So these graphs are useful to see the overall trend, not really as a measure of the amount of traffic. I'm also very proud that um, we've had no unplanned downtime for the Johannesburg Internet Exchange in almost 15 years. Not one minute of unplanned down downtime ever. Uh, a couple of years ago, we hosted a delegation from uh, ICASA, came to visit us uh, to see the exchange and get some feedback on it. And they sat and discussed this for a while. And then they asked these questions and said, how can it be that you have no employees, you have a part-time employee looking after this? A lack of really formal agreements, no budget, a couple of cabinets in a room, and yet you're successfully interconnecting uh, dozens of networks. How do you manage that? Because when we've been to see telecom and the mobile operators, they tell us it's expensive to do interconnection, it requires a lot of staff, it's uh, technically very difficult, it takes a lot of time to get right. And it was really, really pleasant to, to have a cause a walk away from that meeting knowing that they had ammunition to go to telecom and the mobile operators to say, interconnection doesn't need to be difficult. These guys are doing it with no money and no staff very, very successfully. Uh, a couple of other uh, personal highlights. Uh, a couple of instances where ISPA's membership has unusually taken what I feel to be the moral high ground. Some of you may remember a, a, a general meeting about eight, nine years ago where we discussed the issue of charging interest on overdue membership fees. At that point, we had a lot of members who hadn't paid their fees in some time, and it was suggested we should start charging interest. We had one member in, in the audience, uh, a um, Muslim chap, who argued vociferously that his religion wouldn't allow him, uh, his company, to, to belong to an industry association that charged interest. He would, have, he would have to, he would feel an obligation to withdraw from the association. He wasn't arguing for a very strong position because he was one of the, the members in arrears, <laughs> as, and substantially so. So he was in a difficult position. He, he wasn't hot, shy of the fact that, uh, to admit that. Um, and we discussed this for almost uh, two hours of the, the general meeting. And eventually the members uh, put it to a vote and agreed that we couldn't in good conscience charge interest if one of our members had a, a religious problem with us. To his credit, he caught up his back fees and remains a member to this day in good standing. Occasionally, ISPA's made the decision not to fight telecom. The particular example is Tenet. Before there was Tenet, several of the universities were clients of commercial service providers. Telcom came along and there was a very complicated project proposal to consolidate all the university traffic. Telcom would provide a really cut rate pricing to the universities for an extended period, provided they all came on board and bought services. ISPA took legal opinion on whether this was an anti-competitive deal, and the opinion was yes, probably so. Telcom's undercutting the market. They're stealing customers, university customers, from other ISPs. And the management committee made the decision not to make an issue of this. They felt that the benefit to the South African universities in getting this, this cut rate price from Telcom was so significant that it would be morally wrong for ISPA to pursue this, even though the, our legal opinion was that it was an anti-competitive deal. Very interesting that that was a stance taken. Uh, but my, my best highlight uh, over the last 15 years has been meeting inspiring people and seeing ISPs grow. We've seen a lot fall by the wayside, but we've seen a lot grow. I think I now hold the record for visiting the most South African ISPs. I was trying to count exactly and I just couldn't. But I, I think over the years I visited more or less around about 200 ISPs, visited them in their offices. Uh, a couple of years ago, Elaine Breton and I did a road down in the Eastern Cape to, uh, to visit the ISPs down there. In just two days, from one morning to the following evening, we covered 900 kilometers and we visited eight ISPs. It almost killed us, but it was enormous fun. It's, there's something to be said for going and visiting an ISP on their home turf and getting feedback and seeing what their issues are, the day-to-day -day issues, and I really enjoy that part of the work. A few lowlights for me, um, very long meetings. Uh, in 2005, ISPA had just uh, four structures, a management committee, a technical committee, a social development committee, and a regulatory committee. The people involved in the management committee and the regulatory committee were uh, roughly the same. Stop reading ahead. Uh, uh, and we met face to face every three months. So we would have a three or four hour regulatory meeting followed by a three or four hour um, management committee meeting. 
Often issues on the agenda were complicated and they required us to go away and do a bit more research, get more information and give more feedback. <coughs> Three months later we would meet face to face again and everybody would have forgotten that discussion. So in 2005 we had a meeting in May that was almost exactly the same meeting we'd had three months before. And I know I wasn't the only member of the, the management committee that went home and had a good cry about how bad that meeting had been. It was just dreadful. Lynn's nodding, I see. So um, I, I, I spent a lot of the following week thinking about the fact that ISPA really at that point wasn't working. And I made the proposal that we should s disband all our committees and form a much greater number, I think at that stage, 12 working groups, each with a very, very tight focus and move as much of our activities as possible to teleconferences, which we did and I think has paid real dividends for ISPA. We have tightly focused working groups and the teleconferences mean that our participation has increased. Uh, interestingly, the management committee at that stage were nervous about moving just to teleconferences, so we decided we would alternate management committee meetings, one teleconference, one face-to-face -face meeting, one teleconference. We had our first teleconference, worked very well. We had our first face-to-face -face management meeting after the restructuring. At the end of the meeting, everyone said, why did we have a face-to-face -face meeting? And that was the last face-to-face -face meeting in 2005 that the management committee has had other than at iWeek. It's all teleconferences. Uh, personal threats of litigation, on at least three occasions I've had an ISPA member uh, threaten to sue me personally for um, uh, one, one or more of ISPA's policies. That's always fun. It's not terribly um, uh, productive to threaten someone who's trying to help you with uh, litigation. But a uh, positive story, all of those, all three of those potential litigants have had their issues successfully resolved and not sued me, so that's, that's appreciated. Um, and the... the um, Lowlights, dealing with crazy people. If, if, you're, if you're an industry association, you get an awful lot of public queries. A lot of our time is spent dealing with public queries. And we, we get crazy people. And this is, uh, many of you may remember Chris Addington. He lodged a complaint against his upstream service provider for cutting him off for spamming. He has a, let's generously call it a newsletter that he sends out to anyone he can. He always copies it to the Queen, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, the president and a list of other dignitaries that he thinks it's important to get his note. Uh, we went through the process of having his complaint assessed by uh, an uh, independent adjudicator. The independent adjudicator was not convinced that he had a case to force his ISP to keep, keep him on and keep sending out his spam. He then lodged an appeal and he had his appeal denied. He was unhappy with that and decided he would cull the contact details, public contact details for all of his members from our website and spam them all, arguing his case directly. And one of, the, one of his lines, which I've quoted in full, the reason that he felt his appeal had to be heard was that he disproved many Nobel Prize winning economic models, many physical science models, including Einstein's energy and relativity theory, Stephen Hawking's Big Bang theories, Edwin Hubble's expanding universe at near light speed theories. This was one of his motivating factors for why his appeal should be heard. Um, I still, today, get a copy of his monthly newsletter, every month. <laughs> and it remains as enlightening and as fun read every month. Uh, we also have Sarah Spammer. Uh, this was someone who got in contact with Breton to say, look, I know I'm on your hall of shame, and I know your members don't like me sending spam, but please could you ask them to stop being so rude to me? <laughs> so just some thoughts on the future uh, to wrap up. Um, moving forward, I think it would be good to see ISPA building a slightly closer relationship with government. It's, uh, I've done quite a little bit of work in the last few months with the Department of Communications. It's clear to me that they have, um, under the new leadership, the new minister, a clear um, goal of better uh, interaction with industry, better consultation with industry. That's filtered down. The morale at the DOC is the best I've seen it for at least six years. They're really quite committed. Uh, so I hope to see ISPA um, growing that relationship. Um, transformation and supporting entrepreneurs, um, this remains a problem for ISPA. Uh, we'll hear in the working group report back some efforts being made to um, on, on the enterprise development side, but this needs to, to stay on ISPA's horizon. And I think that um, moving forward, more focus on ISPA's exchange points. Um, I'm on the record in 2005 as saying I didn't think ISPA would still be running the exchanges in 2010. I was convinced that a commercial entity would have come along 
roll out a commercial exchange and just uh, been able to compete more effectively with this. But here we are. I'm happy to be proven wrong on that. But um, it's clear that the exchange points are important enough for ISPA's members that ISPA probably needs to be diverting more resources, maybe full-time person looking after the exchange points uh, and just focusing some resources on that. So there's just my thoughts on moving forward. Um, just as a personal postscript, this is um, um, my last iWeek as ISPA's general manager. Uh, I'm not going anywhere far. Uh, uh, when we launched the new working group structure in, in um, 2005, I was running each and every one of those 11 working groups. Over the last three years, um, uh, I've handed out a lot of that work to my team, so I'm down to, I think at this point, running just two of the working groups. Um, so the secretariat team, fantastic, just to um, give them credit. Our core secretariat team, Sarah Jane, Breton, Elaine. We have Dion, who's our webmaster. Lorraine looks after our complaints. Behind the scenes, we have um, Piet and Craig look after the servers. Uh, we have Jackie and Dorcas look after the finances, and Dorcas works with the teachers' tr training working group. Uh, and we have our uh, latest member of staff, uh, Sharon, who's joined us while Sarah Jane is on um, maternity leave, but we think she's a keeper, so you'll be seeing more of her as well. Uh, I'm, I, Mancom has persuaded me to stay on for at least the next two years on an advisory capacity, but I'm just going to take a step back from the day-to-day -day administration of ISPA and hopefully focus a little bit more on some of the strategic issues such as these up here. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, yes and no. The, the initial thrust was definitely not to, to, to specifically exclude telecom. Um, it really was. Uh, this, this had been an issue that everybody was painfully aware of leading up to the, to the formation of ISPA that there wasn't peering happening. So those at the helm, the, the first management committee of ISPA, really wanted to demonstrate that this new association could break through the distrust and do something that was collaboratively a really good idea for the industry. It is, however, true that after the exchange point was launched for uh, the whole of 1998, ISPA had a policy that you could not connect to the exchange point if you were buying upstream services from telecom. Uh, this was, in fact, one of the instances where one of us was members set and, uh, uh, threatened to sue me personally over the policy because, uh, I mean, I had to police this and check who was connecting to whom and say, well, I'm afraid we have to unplug you from the exchange because you're buying services from telecom. Um, in December 1998, we had a, a special general meeting to deal with this, and uh, it was argued successfully um, by me and some other others that uh, a carrot was better than a stick in this case, uh, that it was just not a good idea to say to someone, you shouldn't buy services from telecom uh, and force them not to use something as valuable as the internet exchange. And in retrospect, that was the right decision. It was the right decision just to run the exchange as something useful and not hold it as a stick against telecom.